Hey everyone, welcome to my studio. I am about to paint something and I wanted to jo have you join me and see what I call a no-fail start to a pastel painting. And I know a lot of times we we want to paint something and we get the paper out, we have our subject, and then we first thing we think about is, now what? How do we begin? I mean, what? how do we do a uh, wet underpainting, a dry underpainting, and, and the more you get involved with pastels, the more you realize that there are so many options. In fact, there are so many options for starting a painting that it gets to be overwhelming. So I want to share with you today my no-fail start, meaning good chance you can't go wrong with starting a painting this way. So I'm going to walk you through the steps of painting with the no-fail start and then I will bring the painting to a finish and hopefully within 20-30 minutes we'll have a painting finished. So I want to invite you into my studio to watch me. I'm going to talk a little bit as I go along. If you want more in-depth online instruction, I want to promote today my Patreon page. I don't usually talk about it, but I want to share with you that it's a really good option for you if you want to go more in-depth with pastel. And I have almost three years of content, which is over 200 videos that you have not seen on YouTube. So if you want to have more in-depth instruction, head on over to the Patreon page uh, and just look up my name, Karen Margulis. So, stick with this painting through the end, because as I always say, it goes through the ugly stage, and I want you to be able to see how I finish. All right, let's get started. What do I mean by a no-fail start? Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my reference photo. This is a landscape from Colorado, and for the most part, I like the composition, except for I find that this hill is a little too steep. Was it this steep in real life? It really was. We were way up in the mountains and it was wildflower season and it was amazing. But compositionally, it's going to be like a roller coaster. Imagine sitting in, a, in your roller coaster car and you're going to go right off the page, right off the paper. So when I design this painting, I'm going to give it a slight uptick, right? That way it will hopefully hold our eye in the painting rather than giving us a ride right off the paper. Even though it was actually that steep, I think compositionally I need to make an adjustment. So for the no-fail start, I'm going to do a very quick drawing with a pencil, very lightly. It will get covered up so there's no need to worry about it. You don't want to do anything too dark. Um, so a light pencil is fine. The paper I'm using today is Canson Touch sanded paper. Um, I cut off the, it has a white border. I cut off the border from a full sheet so I could get a 9 by 12 piece of paper. Um, so I, and someone asked me the other day, <clears throat> did I change my mind from using UART paper? Because um, usually I use UART paper. No, I didn't. UART is, is still my favorite paper, I guess, if I had to choose. Um, but I do like to mix it up. I like to have a variety of papers and I like to share a variety of papers with everybody so that they know that you don't just need to work with one type of paper. Alright, so here's my hill. I made it a little less steep. Um, gave it a little smile right here and then what I need to do is establish some of the tree shapes. Um, and I want to just mask them in, right? So I know that they're just some upright shapes right in this general area. I like that there's another tall one right here, and maybe one goes off the page, it's so tall, and then a, a couple over here. So I'm just drawing in the masses. I'm not worrying about the branches or anything like that. Now behind these trees is a distant, another mountain, right? And I'm only going to hint at this mountain, right? I'm not going to make a lot of detail, but I know that it's there. And we will probably need a little guy right in here. Now, so we have the sky shape, the mountain shape, the big tree shapes, and then this foreground area with the wildflowers. But somehow we need to get the viewer's eye to move from the foreground area here up into the rest of the painting. And typically I just like to do kind of a dark mass um, so that 
when I cover it up with flowers and grass, there'll still be bits and pieces of this dark mass, I call it dirt, to just to hold everything in place and subtly direct your eye. Uh, I did have a comment the other day, someone said, you don't always need to have that, there are other ways to, to lead the eye. And I actually make use of other ways to lead the eye, but I do like to have this dirt underneath, otherwise my flowers feel like they're floating on grass. So that's why I do it. It's not just to direct your eye, but it's also to act as kind of like dirt to hold the roots in place. So that's just another way you can think of it. All right, so what is this no-fail start? Well, I'm going to do a dry wash underpainting, but because I, I it's overwhelming to think about how what colors do I need to put in? You know, what what do I where do I do? I my no-fail start requires is simple. You take one color, family, let me hold it up, and then you choose three or four values of that color family. So if I'm going to select for my color family red violet, and the reason why I'm selecting red violet today is because I know I have an overwhelming amount of green in this painting, and I know that the red family, the warm of the red uh, and the pinks, are going to work well with all the greens that I'm going to put on top. So I have a dark red violet and I'm going to start by blocking in the dark shapes. Now if I squint at my photo it's very uh, obvious that the darkest shapes are those upright planes which are the tree shapes. So I'm going to go in with the side of the pastel and block in all those tree shapes realizing that some of the foliage on the, tr the trees are a little bit more sparse so I don't want to have them too solid um, so I'm going to just kind of skip the pastel around a little bit kind of to get that feeling of the, the the branches I think I had another I am also not too concerned with copying my photograph exactly I'm just arranging some tree shapes that have a variety, right? I don't want them all the same shape, the same size, the same height, so that's what I'm going for, a variety. Now remember I wanted to have this kind of dark piece of dirt or area of dirt, so I'm going to use that with the dark. The next thing I'm going to do is say, okay, those are the dark areas, what is the lightest area in this painting? And when I squint at it, it's very obvious that the lightest area is the sky. So I'm going to use a light value of the red violet, it's really just pink, and I'm going to sneak it back there up where the sky is going to be. And it goes about there. Alright, so then I say to myself, okay, there's the darkest, there's the lightest, what would be in between? And I have two areas. I have this hillside and then I have the mountain shape in the background. I think I need to maybe put another tree shape in here. Maybe. I might cover that up. Um, usually the flat areas are going to be a middle value and then slanted areas are a, a darker middle value. But what do we have here? We have actually two slanted areas. But we have light uh, hitting the, the slope. So I'm actually going to go with a lighter, this is a middle value, but it's going to be lighter than the one I'm going to use for the distant hill. I'm going to just cut across my dark shape here. Remember, I'm going to put it in, but ultimately I'm going to cover it up. And then I have a mountain shape that's in the distance that's going to be a little bit it's a middle value, but it's a little bit darker than the one I used on the hillside, or the sunlit part of the hillside. So I'm going to sneak that color back in there. That's the, that's the distant mountain. Alright, now I have all of my shapes blocked in. The next thing that I do is I'm going to blend all of this in. I'm just using a piece of pipe insulation foam. Well, you can feel free to use any blending tool that works for you. Why am I blending in this layer? A uh, couple reasons. I want to get rid of the light tone on the paper. Although this is a gray piece of paper and it's really not that um, distracting. But if I'm working on white paper, or UART, which is very light, 
uh, the, the paper color can be a distraction. I also want to make this out of focus. And I want to make it out of focus so that then I have the power to choose where I want to put the clarity and the focus and the painting. So I'm just blending it all in, but I'm using this piece of pipe insulation as if it were a brush. So I'm not just going back and forth, I'm trying to paint with it. And that just kind of helps get you in the right frame of mind for your painting. Alright, so this is step one. This is what I call the no-fail start. Why is it a no-fail start? Because you now have a road map to follow with your painting. You know where the dark areas are, you know where the light areas are, you know where everything else falls into place. You have your composition all laid out. Now all you have to do is follow it with your softer pastels. Now for today I'm using Terry Ludwig pastels. This set is the Richard McKinley selection. So this was one, um, I've got this several years ago and I keep it in this box because I take it out every once in a while and say, you know what, today I want to challenge myself and just use this particular palette. So I will do that. I will also supplement with a few extra pastels that I feel I need that are not in this set, but for the most part I'm going to use this set. So the first thing I'm going to do is reestablish those dark areas. So I'm going to just come in with a dark burgundy and I'm going to actually come in and put in some of those trunks that I see and I'm going to reestablish the branches, but this time I have to pay a little bit more attention to the way they grow. Otherwise what's going to happen is it's not going to look like the right type of tree. So I'll look at my photo just to get give me some idea of how the branches come off those trunks. And of course every tree that you paint is going to be different, but if you can have some of the foliage look like that particular tree, then your eye will fill in the rest so you don't have to have everything spelled out exactly the way it is. So remember I wanted to put a little guy in here. He's just a lonely little guy. Then we'll come over here, establish the trunk, and then some of those branches, the way they are coming off the tree. One thing about when you're painting these these fir trees, uh, it's very easy for your brain to take over and say, oh, you know what, those are fir trees, those are like Christmas trees, and before you know it, you've got the typical Christmas tree shape, <clears throat> and all your trees start to look the same. And I can probably guarantee that it'll happen here in this painting, even though I, I, I know to watch out for that. It's just something that, that happens. All right, so we've got our trees blocked in. Or reestablish. I'm going to reestablish my dirt. And then I'm going to move on to another layer of color. And I think I'm going to go right into the dark green at this point because I already have three layers of color. So I'm going to just go over those darks very lightly with a dark value cool green. A nice dark blue green. And I don't want to cover up the other colors that are already there. I want them to all work together. That's what the beauty of pastel is how we can layer. I could just have gone in and say, oh, it's a tree, it's green, let's go ahead and start with green. But by layering multiple layers of color that are the same value, I'm going to get more interesting color. Hopefully, that's the goal. So there's the green. Now, I do need to work more on the tree shapes, give them a feeling of light, um, a little more detail, but really for me, it's about this foreground meadow that I'm really interested in. So I'm going to spend more time on that than I will on the trees. I do have to determine where the light is coming from. and. Uh, when I look at this scene, I can see that it feels to me like the right side of some of these trees are getting the sunlight. So I'm going to go ahead and 
say that the sun is over here on the right. And just so that I don't forget that, I'm going to add a little bit of light on the right side of some of these trees. I'm going to come back on uh, and work on these trees a little bit more, but this is just as a reminder for myself. All right, <clears throat> so the next thing that I want to do is work on what's behind and then come forward. So I'm going to get all this top area finished and then come to the front. So I want to establish that distant mountain and the sky. Um, if I look at that distant mountain, it seems to be a collection of interesting violets and gray. So I, I'm going to pick up a nice gray down, kind of a grayish blue, and just kind of poke it back behind the trees. This is also my tool to carve the tree shapes. And it goes way down here. And I'm, I'm perfectly okay with letting the, the, um, the red violet of the underpainting peek through. Okay, there are some areas in here that feel like they're getting a little bit of... It wasn't snowing because it was summer and there was no snow, but it's a lighter value back there. Maybe let's try. Sometimes we just have to play around till we get what we want. Let's try this pale violet just to indicate some of the light areas on that mountain. And then actually even further back there's another kind of ridge. And so I'm going to make that a, a nice a pretty blue violet and then poke it behind the trees. Oh, there goes my dog Heidi. She's guarding the front door. There's another nice mauve. So I'm just mixing the, what I love about this Richard McKinley set and why I selected it for this painting is it's loaded with beautiful, colorful neutrals. And that, that might sound silly. What do you mean colorful neutrals? They're they're neutrals, but they actually have beautiful color. <coughs> so the violets and the blues, but they're not pure, intense, bright colors. They're just very soft, um, neutral colors. All right, now we have the sky. Now here's something interesting. It was probably a blue sky day because there's sunlight on the trees. But what, because I painted the sky pale pink, I have the option of giving it a moody kind of pink sky feeling or I could go with the blue sky. Um, that's why I like to pick different underpainting colors because it gives me options. But I think I will go with the blue sky. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to pick a very light value turquoise color for the sky and then as it comes closer to the horizon let's utilize some of that pink kind of give it a little bit of a haziness to the sky so there's some blue in it but yet it's got a little bit of haze to it that's a good compromise I'm doing what I call a fractured sky where I'm just layering colors that are the same value so that they work well together and so that's a lesson we just had over on my Patreon page, Skies and Clouds. There's so much that I want to share that it's hard to fit it in each individual demo. But I do my best to share a lot of information. Alright, so there's my fractured sky. And my distant mountain. My trees. And now we've got the foreground. Before I finish the foreground, I'm going to work a little bit more on the tree shapes. And the reason why is because as I'm making marks up here, the dust falls onto my painting. And I don't want it to fall on the foreground uh, if I had that all finished. I'm going to give a quick spray to the tree shape with a little workable fixative. And I like to use this Blair, very low odor. So it's, it doesn't have a... 
it is very low odor, so it works for me. I'll let it dry, and you might be saying, well, why are you, why are you spraying fixative on your trees? Well, I want to get a feeling of texture in those tree branches and the foliage without having to paint every single um, every single leaf or pine needle in this case. I and when when I use the fixative and it'll hopefully it'll show up for you. Um, let's see when I use the fixative, the lighter colors skip over the dark. And it creates a, li a little bit of texture, but it's not, it's just, it's just an illusion. It's not real texture. Um, I'm going to put some little guys in the distance. Now, in this set, let's see, I used that one. The ones that are further back, I'm going to use more of a blue-green, just so that they don't look like soldiers all in a row. So this guy over here will get a blue-green. But I do want to supplement a little bit more. There's not a lot of greens in this particular set, so I want to go ahead and use some of the new pastels. Or When I say new pastels, I'm referring to the brand and you. They're harder pastels. So it really allows me to um, expand my palette and not expand my or take away from my wallet because they're less expensive so if I have a nice set of expensive hard past or soft pastels and some inexpensive harder pastels I can stretch my budget my painting budget a little bit more so I'm using some of these harder sticks to give a little more mileage to the greens that I didn't have in the larger set. Also, I'm going to reestablish some of those trunks that got lost along the way. Now, one thing I what, here I'm working on these trees. I I I could very easily get carried away. Uh, and just continue to work on the trees and then neglect the rest of the painting. So what I want to encourage you to do is always work a little bit in one area and then say, okay, time to move on. I'll come back if I feel like I need to come back, but you really, really need to move on because you don't know if you're finished when you have only half the painting worked on. So that means I'm going to move forward to my foreground area. I've established this dirt pathway, uh, anchor shape, if you want to call it that, um, and I have some color down there for underneath all of the grasses and the flowers. I think I really want to expand upon this, un this um, these pink colors and add a little bit more of a pinky peach down in here just to really enhance the color that's going to be in this field. Again, what is the idea of the beauty of pastel is the ability that we have to create layers, layers of interesting color. So I'm expanding on the red violet and adding a little bit more of a salmon color to the mix. Uh, but the pinks and the salmon color that are down here are relating to the little bits and pieces of pink that are showing through in the rest of the painting. All right, now I've got the dirt in place. I've got interesting color down there. Now I want to start to add the greens. And the first thing I'm going to ask myself, are there any flower shapes that are going to be larger than an inch? Because if there are, I want to mask them in right now before I start the green. So I look at the scene here and I, <coughs> I see some flowers that I want to play with. I, there's some white uh, interesting flowers here and here and some purple ones and some yellow ones. But they're not in a very good arrangement, right? So I have to take charge of this and design the flowers in a little bit better arrangement. Now actually, 
because I added the dark there, I adjusted the slope so much that it was now not even a slope. So I do like the idea of the slope, but not as dramatic as the photo. So I want to reestablish a little bit more of that feeling of the hillside. Well, without pulling you off the page exactly. So I can do it two ways. I can bring the dark down there, and then I can bring the lighter part, the green, up. So there I've reestablished a little bit stronger slopes. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead with massing in some flowers. So I've got some purple flowers that I want to play with. And they're going to be right in here. I think I need to go a little bit darker with my purple. So my purple flowers, I think, will be the star flowers. So I want to bring them up into the painting. And I'm massing them in, first of all. Um, then I've got those light color flowers, and those are pretty interesting. Um, and there's some right in here, so I'm going to mass a few in right in here. And I like how they kind of are back in the distance. So I'll mask some over here. And I do really like how they're kind of coming up over the trees because that shows our different point of view, right? We're, we're kind of down here looking up. So if I pull some of these flowers up over the tree, that get, helps establish that point of view. And let's just throw a few down in here. So these are the masses. Now we're going to do the green, and then we'll come back and refine those flowers. So in the distance... We're going to start with a lighter, kind of cooler green. And ever so slightly, it's coming up over the tree line. All right, some of the green. So this is the kind of more of a cooler blue green. Uh, we need to establish some of the darker green kind of along this pathway that we had. Actually, we need to get a little bit darker. So I'm going to pull out that dark green that we used in the trees and a little bit of kind of a middle value green. And a little bit of a more yellow green in the sunlit areas. Now you might be saying, but now Karen, you've covered up all your masses of the flowers that you put in. And that's exactly what I want to do because I want there to be hints of them. And then I'm going to come back and establish them in more detail. So the next thing I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm, we're getting to the finish line here. Give it another quick spray, and I want you to watch what it does. I'm making it splatter to give interest and texture to this field. Uh, but look at how immediately it darkened the values of the grass. And I did that on purpose because I want that to be a little bit darker. And now when I come back over, as soon as it dries, with some, it's not quite dry, so it will only work when it's dry. When I come back over, it skips over the dark. Let's make some light kind of sprinkle down into the shadows. But see where it skips over the dark? It kind of gives a really interesting effect of um, grasses showing the dark underneath. So you can see, hopefully you can see why I put the dark underneath, uh, because now it is actually doing its job. It might not have made sense in the beginning of the painting, but hopefully you can see why you do it. And then finally, let's leak some of that light back down into the grass again. And the last thing we're going to do is add some finishing touches, some final details to the flowers and I've masked them in but now I want to actually put in the shapes of them. So you look at your flowers and you say okay what kind of shapes do I see? Well these are more upright type flowers whatever they are. Um, 
But as I go into the distance, they are going to get smaller. Right? So in the foreground, they can be bigger, more detailed. When they're in the distance, they're going to be smaller. So, yeah, they get smaller. And then I'm going to add a little light to the tops of them. Um... And I don't want to put a lot of detail in these flowers because it, they're just all a collection in this, in the grand scheme of things, in this meadow. Now let's refine some of these. <coughs> By the way, it's allergy season in North Georgia. I think the pollen count yesterday was the highest it's been in years. So that's, I'm adding little tiny bits of these flowers that are in the distance, right? Because you can just see little bits of them right back there. But then as we come forward, they're going to get a little bit more detailed. And one thing about the flowers is you use them as stepping stones into the painting. So when I talked about earlier in this in the demo how there are other ways to lead the viewer into the painting, that's exactly right. And so the dark pathway is one way, but then the way you arrange your shapes and the contrast you provide is another way. So this is the refining stage of the painting. I added a kind of off... Um, not exactly white, it was kind of a, almost a, a beigey co color. So now I'm brightening up those white flowers with a lighter value. And I'm going to kind of put underneath a little bit of that blue-gray. Now what else was there in the field was some really wonderful yellow flowers. They were over in the corner. Now I put them in the corner. If I put it too close to the edge, you don't want your eye necessarily to go there. So you really want to arrange them in such a way that they lead the viewer into the painting. But then again, you don't want it to be too contrived where everything's all in the same place. So it makes sense that a few of them could be growing all in the periphery of the painting. So arranging these flower shapes are all done by design. They're not, it's not random. You don't just go random and make... Um, polka dots. So then the final thing that I do is I add a little bit of interest in the grassy areas, meaning a little more detail. So I'm using the harder pastels just to kind of come in and create some linear mark making to suggest some of the grasses in the foreground area. And also in this particular painting, because of the point of view, we have the ability to see grasses kind of growing up into over the tree line. And that's just by virtue of you being down here looking up the slope. So I'll put a little bit of tiny bits of grass kind of pulling up over the trees. Now, and this is the part always where you can certainly get carried away and you as an artist can decide just how much detail you want to have in your grasses. Um, you know, there are days where I feel like I want a little more detail than other days, where I feel like I want to really play with this and spend a lot of time, and then there are other days where I'm happy with just a, 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 a nice, gentle feeling and not a lot of detail. And as an individual artist, that's going to be up to you as to how much detail you actually are going to be happy with. I'm going to add a little bit of warmer light on the edges of some of these branches. And finally, I kind of want to knit together the colors in the sky. So I'm going to take that pale pink and just go over these areas a little bit more in the sky and create a better silhouette with my tree shapes. So a little bit more with the sky holes. Clean these areas up a little bit. 
And this is the time in every painting when I need to step away and I need to say, hmm, where do I need to put the, a little bit more clarity? Where do I need to put a little bit more detail? I can see I want a little more clarity on the edges of these flowers in this area. And once I step back, I'll be able to see if the arrangement of, of flower shapes that I have suit me. I think I'm going to go with this color and just hint at some of that rocky slope. And that will carry this color up into the background a little bit better. I think that works. So I'm going to stop at this point because the, the really the goal of this painting was not so much the finish but the start. And if you recall, I was sharing with you what I call the no-fail start. And the no-fail start is simple. Pick one color family, three or four values of each color, block it in, and you've got a roadmap to follow. So, I hope you've enjoyed today's demo, and check me out over on the Patreon page so that you can get more in-depth lessons. I'd love to see you there. I'd love for you to join us, um, and I will see you next time.